Welcome to the External Medicine Podcast. My name is Daniel Belkin, and I'm here with my co-host and brother, Mitch Belkin. We're both medical students interested in non-traditional ideas and innovation. This podcast is our attempt to explore topics currently on the outskirts of medicine, topics not widely accepted by the mainstream, but that we believe merit a closer look. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. We do not endorse any healthcare providers or treatments. Our views do not represent the views of any official organization or institution. If you'd like to support us, follow us on Twitter at exmedpod and sign up for our newsletter at external medicine podcast podcast.com forward slash subscribe. All right. In this episode, we will be interviewing Dr. Catherine Flegel. Dr. Flegel is an epidemiologist and former senior scientist at the CDC's National Center for Health Statistics. She is one of the most cited scientists in the field of obesity epidemiology. And in this episode, we talk about her research on BMI and obesity. We also talk about her recent 2021 article, The Obesity Wars and the Education of a Researcher, a Personal Account. In 2005 and 2013, Dr. Flegel published two papers in JAMA. The first of these uses the N. Haynes data set, and the second was a meta-analysis. Mitch, what is the N. Haynes data set? I'm glad you asked that question, Daniel. N. Haynes stands for National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey is basically a big comprehensive data set available to all researchers. It's nationally representative U.S. cross-sectional data that combines interviews, physical exams, lab tests, along with demographic, socioeconomic, and dietary data. So Flegel's 2005 and 2013 papers kind of show similar things. Basically, people who are underweight and people who are obese have increased mortality compared to people who are normal weight. That's not super surprising. The interesting thing is people who are overweight, defined as a BMI between 25 and 30, have substantially lower all-cause mortality as compared to people who are normal weight. Another surprising thing is that there's no significant difference in mortality between people who have a BMI between 30 and 35 and people who are normal weight. What else ends up getting mentioned in this interview? Oh, yeah, the Ansel Keys starvation study. Mitch, why don't you tell us what that is? So Ansel Keys was an American physiologist, and he's basically a giant in the field of nutrition. He's responsible for popularizing the Mediterranean diet along with his wife. He also developed K-rations, the balanced meal for combat soldiers that was used in World War II. I think it's still used, if I'm not mistaken. One famous experiment that he did was the Minnesota starvation experiment in 1944, where they intentionally starved 36 consenting research participants to 25% below their baseline body weight. So they took all these people and they said, we're going to starve you. And they said, sure, sign us up. The study is actually the reason we know a lot about the psychological and physiological effects of starvation and refeeding. Um, It's kind of hard to imagine getting an IRB for that today, but so it went in 1944. Uh, one quick little tidbit on that. I, I think they were actually conscientious objectors who wanted to contribute to the war effort without actually going off to fight. So yeah, very, very interesting study. Couldn't do it today. I guess the last thing I'll say before we start the interview is that the audio quality is not the best. So we apologize. It does improve as the episode goes on. It's really the worst in the first like mi- couple minutes. Um, and Dr. Flegel does not have any financial conflicts of interest. And now we bring you Dr. Catherine Flegel. We are here with Dr. Catherine Flegel. Catherine, thank you so much for joining us on the External Medicine Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm fine. How, how are you? Doing well so that we all get a a better sense of your background and research interest. What exactly is your scientific background and what sorts of issues have you spent your career researching? 
Well, I have a PhD in nutrition from Cornell with a minor in statistics. And I originally started out doing some animal research with these pigs. And I decided that was not really for me. And I became more uh, interested in methodological issues, statistical issues. I did my dissertation on the obscure subject or then obscure subject of weight height indices, such as body mass index, which now everybody knows about. And then I also got a master's degree in epidemiology from the University of Pittsburgh. My interests were really in anthropometry, body measures, and in these weight height indices. And one of the reasons I went to work at Ed Haynes was because they have a lot of data on anthropometry. But then as obesity uh, became a more of a uh, hot topic, and we had all this data at Ann Haynes. We actually found that the prevalence of higher weight was increasing, which nobody knew at that point. So I became more involved in the methodological issues around research on basically obesity and health outcomes and prevalence of obesity. So you, you mentioned that you did work on weight height measurements that now have become known as obesity. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, I was just interested. I mean, body mass index is not a measure of obesity. I mean, now it's used that way, but it wasn't supposed to be that way originally. It's just a way of adjusting weight for height. I just became interested in how do you combine different anthropometric measures for different purposes that you might have looking at outcomes. So at that point, there was no suggestion even that, that body mass index should be used to define obesity. That really was not in the cards at that point. So it was just kind of a, a measure an adjustment measure, which is really all it is. It's really just a way to adjust weight for height. But these categories developed over the years, and especially in the 1990s, these categories being developed and labeled as overweight and obesity with these particular levels of body mass index that identified them. That was all after my time in that sense. I, it hadn't happened yet. So we understand that BMI is simple formula weight in kilograms divided by height in meters squared. And then you you mentioned the different categories that I, I assume most of our listeners are familiar with, where if your BMI is less than 18.5, you're underweight. If it's between 18.5 and 24.9, normal BMI, 25 to just under 30 is considered overweight. And then you have 30 plus obesity, uh, which is graded into grade one, grade two, grade three. So where did this classification system actually come from originally? Well, that's a, an interesting question. It's kind of complicated. Basically, it, it arose in the 1990s with um, a WHO report on the obesity, the global epidemic. Now, that report was actually written by an entity called the International Obesity Task Force, which was a group of scientists. It was put together and financed mostly by the drug companies, actually. And it changed the... In 1995, WHO put out a really huge report on anthropometry, all kinds of anthropometry, so stunting, wasting, infants, newborns, children, adults, older adults, thin people, heavy people the whole spectrum. And in that report, they had three categories of overweight, which they described as arbitrary. And they had the arbitrary cut points of 25, 30, and 40. And there's and they say, well, 30 is about where the risk starts to increase. But there's no specific details about this. I mean, they're obviously measures that have digit preference because they're ending in five and zero. Nature does not usually favor us with measures that are that conveniently organized. So, and they were very clear that there wasn't any um, any measure of BMI that would correspond to any particular measure. But they weren't going to define obesity in terms of body fat. They weren't going to identify any measure of uh, using BMI. They didn't use the word obesity. And in fact, if you look back at Ansel Keys, what he wrote uh, the paper that really renamed body mass index. She said it thought it was scientifically indefensible to use BMI to label categories such as overweight. So you see, we've gone a long way since then. So this 95, 1995 WHO report had these three categories. Now, there was this, the International Obesity Task Force was formed just a, a, in actually the same year as the WHO report came out. And their task, the original task, was to get WHO to have a consultation on obesity. 
And WHO was a little reluctant because obesity was more like a first world kind of problem. And WHO didn't really deal in that kind of issue. But through some process that I don't really know the details, they did get WHO to have a consultation on obesity. And the report was written, uh, drafted by the International Obesity Task Force. And it was pretty much not quite verbatim, but close to verbatim, the same as the final report WHO, WHO put out. That report says in a table that we're using the same categories from this 95 report. And they are using the same categories, but they're not using the same words. They're using the word overweight for all their categories. They're using the word obesity for BMI of 30 or above. And that's where that started. Now, the International Obesity Task Force published a, a, an interim version of that report in 1997. It was published as a WHO technical report in 2000. I've always wondered why did they publish this interim report? It got sent. They, somebody uh, paid for having this interim report sent out to the health ministry of, of every country in WHO and also free copies to almost anybody who wanted one. I myself got two of them. You didn't have to ask for them. They just came in the mail. So they really were broadcasting this report around very widely. Now, in 1998, came out the final report of the NHLBI committee, NIH committee, on guidelines for overweight and obesity, which had uh, four members of the International Obesity Task Force on it. And that group adopted these WHO recommendations coming from this consultation report. So there was kind of this change that was really happened very rapidly, basically, where this Committee was formed in 95. They wrote this report. They used the word obesity for BMI. That was adopted by the U.S. government. And there you were. Now, BMI is a measure of obesity, a definition of obesity, which it wasn't before. <laughs> I just I guess wrote a book chapter about this. That's why I know all these things. <laughs> oh, this is wonderful. This is great. So you mentioned Ansel Keynes. Keynes. And I'm sorry, Ansel Keys. Um, is that the University of Minnesota researcher? That's him. Who did the, um, I remember learning about the starvation studies that he did in the 30s, 40s. Yeah. So it's interesting the way that obesity measures and BMI were essentially made up based off of nice numbers, 25, 30, 40, um, and eventually became adopted by the U.S. government. I guess my question is, uh, with regards to alternative ways that could have been used to demonstrate obesity, there are other anatomic measurements that some people believe are better quantification methods like waist circumference or waist to hip ratio. Were there any reasons why those have not become as popular as BMI? Or what are some reasons for that? Well, BMI is the easiest measure. First of all, weight and height, you can measure very accurately more so than waist circumference or waist to hip ratio or something like that, which has all these judgment issues of where exactly you put the tape and what is the point. So any, anyone can get a scale and get on it and figure out how much they weigh. Anyone can get out a tape measure and see how tall they are. And so it's the easiest measure to calculate. And it's also the uh, probably the most accurate that you can get even at measured weights and heights. And then people can report a lot of these big epidemiological studies get self-reported weight and height. Now, I personally think there's a lot of problems with self-reported weight and height, but you can certainly collect them. Most people will answer those questions and give reasonable sounding answers. So BMI is just more accessible and easier to deal with than these other kinds of measures. In the Haynes data, we looked at the, at the relationship. We had body fat measures and also waist circumference and BMI. And BMI and, and waist circumference are extremely highly correlated. They're more correlated with each other than either of them is with body fat, actually. So they almost are the same measure for many practical purposes, I would say. And there's another sort of aspect of people, I noticed this in research that people are saying, well, in effect, the best measure of obesity is the one that has the highest relationship to some health outcome. That isn't necessarily quite makes sense because obesity should mean a certain amount of body fat. Now, what amount of body fat is that? There's no definition of that either, really. If you look at the WHO definitions or the government definitions, it says things like obesity is the amount of body fat, excess body fat that is associated with health risk. Well, okay, so what is that level? And how do you decide if you have a patient? I mean, you guys are doctors or not to be doctors, so 
you know, the patient, how would you decide if the person had excess body fat that was, might cause health risks? And that's just kind of up in the air. I mean, there's just there's nothing written down that I've ever really seen that is very clear about exactly what should that be. People fall back on the EMI of 30, which itself doesn't have much of a real clear definition either. So the whole uh, situation is kind of fluid and vague if you start looking at where these numbers actually come from. So we want to talk a little bit about your recent published article, The Obesity Wars and the Education of a Researcher, a Personal Account. However, before we get there, we want to talk a little bit about your 2005 and your 2013 paper when you were at the CDC. So can you tell us some about, I guess we could start with the 2005 paper, like what did you look at? What did you find? What was surprising about those results? Well, for the 2005 paper, our interest was in trying to get some kind of estimate of of excess mortality associated with different BMI levels. We use the standard BMI categories of underweight and normal weight and overweight and obesity. And we felt the existing literature was pretty scanty and wasn't really uh, very adequate for a number of reasons. The data weren't really that great, and the methods were kind of questionable. So we set about this project. It took a lot of work. It looked, took several years. And we created these methods. We used the Ann Haynes data, which is nationally representative data from the United States and has measured weight and height and has all these good properties attached to it. Since we're trying to estimate deaths associated with obesity in the United States, we have nationally representative data from the United States. So that's a plus right there. And we, we worked this all out and we published this article and it found we found that um, overweight was associated with fewer deaths than normal weight by about 86,000. And we found that obesity was associated with more deaths than normal weight, about 112,000. If you add those two together, the total for overweight and obesity is only about 26,000 deaths. And actually, even for grade one obesity, we didn't really find significantly increased mortality. We found increased, not significant. Now, but without our realizing it, there was also a similar project underway at CDC itself, the rest of CDC, that was published in 2004, before ours came out. And that paper said that there were, that the uh, deaths sort of due to or associated with obesity was so high it was about to overtake smoking as a cause of death. And this got a huge fury, and it was a much higher number than we had. So then we published our article. So there was a lot of reasons why people were startled by it, I guess, because our numbers were so different from the ones that, and we were also, we were CDC and NIH employees ourselves, and they were, the numbers were so different from what CDC had just itself put out a year earlier. And also just the finding that obesity, that overweight was associated with fewer deaths. And when I published this paper, I had glanced at the literature, like, is this going to be a problem with this, this finding that overweight? Is this reasonable? I looked at the literature. I kind of glanced at it. So I'm like, okay, some articles find a little bit lower, some a little bit higher. We're right in the ballpark, no problem. Well, it turned out that was a misjudgment on my part because it was really attracted a lot of attention. Why did you use the N. Haynes database? And what were the advantages of that database over other databases that were available for you to do this analysis? Well, I worked, I worked at the Ann Haynes program. So that was, I was in the group that produced the Ann Haynes data. And the Ann Haynes data is very high quality. It's a national representative sample. It's done very carefully. And it's because it's nationally representative, that's an asset when you're trying to make estimates for the US population. The other data sets that were used by other people, um, they used one of the Ed Haynes data sets, but they used other data sets that were, you know, smaller and had, some of them had self-reported weight and height, and they weren't nationally representative, so we felt that the Ed Haynes data would be better. And the, the way we were going to do this, we, we developed risk estimates from the Ed Haynes data that had mortality follow-up, but we mapped those estimates onto the current U.S. population, also from Haynes. So we really had risk estimates using comparable data to the, the data set that we were using to get the final estimates. Everything was, was kind of matched and similar and used similar methods. So it was more internally consistent than anything else we could have done. In terms of um, excess deaths, you mentioned those calculations. Like, How do you actually calculate what are so-called excess deaths? 
Well, this is what's called in epidemiology attributable fractions. And the idea is that this is a counterfactual estimate. We say, well, this is the risk, like if everybody had the same risk as normal weight people, how many deaths would you expect in this other group versus how many actually occurred? And so the difference, so it's not a, it's not an individual number. It's not saying this person died because they were in this category. It's saying overall, I would expect to have, say, 100 deaths in this category, but I saw 200. So I'm, well, let's say I, I would expect, I, I saw 150 deaths in this category, but I would have expected 100 if they were all normal weight. The excess mortality then is 50, the difference between 150 and 100. So this is a population of the thing. I predict or expect or, or you know estimate that 50 of these deaths are due to being in this category, but I don't know which 50. I just think that overall there are 50. That's the kind of estimate it is. One of the surprising findings from that paper was that overweight individuals had significantly less mortality when compared to their normal weight peers. Moving on now to your 2013 paper, what did you find there? Well, let me give you a little background first. There was also a national study in Canada by Heather Arpana and colleagues, and, and they found the same thing that we had, another national data set by a statistical agency that has no axe to grind. Their business, like ours, was just to get estimates for the population. And so um, their paper found the same thing we had. Then people started this kind of thing, well, these are the only two papers that have ever found, which frustrated both Heather and myself. It's like, wait a minute, we already both know that there are lots of other papers that have found the same thing, yet people are talking as though our paper is the only ones that have ever shown this. So out of that frustration, we first started making a list of all the papers that have shown that overweight had lower mortality or no excess mortality relative to normal weight. And after looking at that for a while, so let's just really do this right, try to get all the papers so that we develop the search strategy found all the papers we could and use general population studies and use these categories of normal weight, overweight, et cetera, in general population uh, studies and populations and, and try to find all those we could and extract all the information we could. And we wrote a uh, meta-analysis that we published in 2013. And that showed uh, that there were, we found 97 studies, uh, almost 3 million participants in these studies and basically, it came out with more or less the same results, a slight but significant uh, reduction in mortality in the overweight category relative to the, and in the overweight category relative to the normal weight category. So our results were right in line with that, causing some people to say, well, we must have cooked the books, <laughs> because otherwise we would have found the same thing in both studies. But we didn't cook the books. We found every study we could. And how do your findings intersect with the obesity paradox? I guess you could also explain what, what is the obesity paradox and how does that intersect with your work? Well, the obesity paradox started life in an article that said, well, obesity is a risk factor for heart disease, but when you do, um, in, in after treatment, the heavier people are having better outcomes. So this is a paradox. This is described as a paradox because the risk factor for something is also something that suggests that the outcome after treatment is better. So that's kind of unexpected. Now, this observation is really common, but it has morphed, I would say, into being uh, just a very general, very vague kind of wording. It's not a, I don't like the term obesity paradox. It's not a scientific term. A paradox is a rhetorical term, a rhetorical device. It kind of implies that something is uh, inexplicable or, or con contra you know, contrary to the two things are contrary to each other in some way. Like it made sense in the original thing. Okay, uh, people who are uh, who weigh more are more at risk, yet fare better after treatment. Okay, so that's kind of seems contradictory. That could be a paradox. Now it's become a term just globally used for really anything you feel like using it for practically. Anything bad about obesity is the and how good about obesity is the obesity paradox and disprove the obesity paradox. I personally don't feel this is a very constructive term. So you have these findings that were replicated not only in the 2005 and 2013 paper, but also in from researchers in Canada. 
I guess I, I, this maybe is not a fair epidemiologic question, but why do you think that there is a decrease in mortality among people who are overweight or uh, mildly obese as compared to so-called normal weight people? Well, I don't really know. And let me say that first, but I would uh, say that the, um, the categories may not be very helpful in and they're not really the right categories. They are arbitrary. And in the U.S., up until the 1998 HLBI report, we didn't regard someone with a BMI of 25 as overweight at all. We didn't even use that word. You had to be have a BMI of 27.8 if you were a man or 27.3 for a woman to be categorized as overweight. So we the, this uh, new definition dropped the line squarely into people that are you would probably consider pretty normal weight if you saw them walking down the street. So we, we, these are not really, they, people talk about excess fat and media coverage of overweight often shows people who are extremely heavy, but actually what someone looks like with a BMI of 25, I think you might not really think that's what we're talking about. So I think these are pretty normal people in many ways and even up to the the grade one overweight, grade one obesity category, these people are not hugely overweight. So I think that's part of the confusion. I think these words are not very helpful. I wish the categories were just like A, B, C, and D or something like that that didn't have all this uh, kind of other ideas and meaning attached to them. I think that's not helpful either. And it's possible. There's an article that just got published by these researchers in Germany that I thought was very sensible. These are experts. These are not, you know, fly-by-night researchers. And they were saying, well, really, probably lean mass and muscle mass is much more important. And body fat probably doesn't really matter that much. And there is some research that suggests that body fat is not the issue. We all think of body fat because we're talking about obesity and fatness and so on. But actually, maybe lean mass is more important. And what they point out is that as people get older, their body composition tends to change. People become uh, less muscular and, and have more body fat. And so that maybe at older ages, where most deaths occur, of course, we're, doing, we're talking about estimates of deaths due to obesity. Most deaths are occurring in older people. They're not occurring in the, the 40 and 50-year-olds that people are studying. They're occurring in people who are 70 and 80 and 90. So these, um, this German paper points out that at older ages, probably people who weigh more have more muscle mass, not just they have more body fat, they also have more muscle. And maybe that's one of the reasons for this right there. And what they actually suggest is we should just jettison the whole BMI and the body fat uh, apparatus. And you know, not, this is not really the important thing to measure anyway. And that's possible. We're just not measuring the right thing at all. We're so focused on fatness and body fat and obesity that we're overlooking the other part of body composition, which is people's bone and muscle. Interesting. So now let's talk a little bit about your recent article in the journal, Progress in Cardiovascular Diseases. What was your article about and why did you feel compelled to write it? Well, my article was really about my personal experiences after I published the article in 2005 and then going forward, publishing the article in 2013. And just all the kind of things that I thought were, were unexpected and I really had thought people would, that scientists would not behave like that, and they did. And just the kinds of attacks on our work that, that people uh, came up with that really surprised me. And I thought, you know, this is happening. It's very worth writing up. And I got the idea somehow. I don't remember exactly why that someone said you could write a personal account. I was like, well, who cares about that? You know, so I thought, well, maybe there is something here. And I kind of drafted something. I had time on my hands. and. A friend of mine said, well, you could send it to this one journal because they published personal accounts. I sent it to them, a version, and they just sent it right back to me. Who cares about this? And so I didn't do anything for a while. Then I wrote another version, a little longer, and I sent it to uh, the Annals of Internal Medicine because of this whole thing with the, the whole controversy over the, the meat guidelines. I don't know if you are familiar with that, but there have been a sort of a similar round of attacks on this this group wrote about five papers having to do with guidelines on meat consumption 
and come up with they came up with the, the result that there was not much good data and you might as well just eat whatever you were already eating, <laughs> something like that. And they got really attacked a lot. And I recognized some of the language that was being used to attack them. I thought this is exactly the same language that was used to attack my work. I, I recognized these phrases. This was like a playbook. So I sent a version to the Annals of Internal Medicine, but they also rejected it immediately. And then um, I asked the editor, I was, I was corresponding with the editor of Progress in Cardiovascular Diseases about something else. I just asked him if he had some idea of where I could submit this paper, and he said that he would be interested in it. So that's how it came about. And I just felt, you know, that people should kind of know some of the things that might go on behind the scenes. We see the published work, and then we read, you know, stories about. We also have other sources of information that are that are um, other kinds of information that's getting put out there, and other things are happening that are really very different and very what I would call kind of political in some sense. Not political in the sense of you know Republicans and Democrats kind of political, but like here's um, an attack that's not based on the science. It's a non-scientific attack. And that's what I thought was important for people to maybe realize this could be happening. Can you tell us some of the examples of those attacks from your article, just so that people who are listening who haven't had a chance to read it will get a sense what you're referring to when you say that? Yeah, well, the attacks started almost right away. Like I put out the 2005 article, got a ton of media coverage. I had phone calls from all over. And fairly soon after the initial uh, reporters caught, I realized that a professor from the Harvard School of Public Health had preemptively began contacting reporters, and they had already spoken to him before they spoke to me. And he was using language about my article that was not evidence-based. It was like, this is, you know, flawed and, and ludicrous and and really, really poor quality. So really negative words, really disparaging words. And I was very surprised by this because, you know, he, he wasn't a statistician. He didn't know anything. He hadn't written any articles himself about calculating deaths due to obesity. And, and his content of his remarks were, were just, you know, insulting and, and didn't convey any information. I was like, why are the journalists publishing these kind of words? <laughs> they, they don't contribute anything to the discussion. And then about a month later, another, uh, not a professor, but someone for the American Cancer Society, another associate of the first guy, came to the National Cancer Institute, and two of my co-authors just from the National Cancer Institute gave a talk that basically suggested we shouldn't even have published our article, that it was inappropriate to put these estimates out without getting consensus and so on, which is really strange because the 2004 article hadn't gotten that kind of criticism, yet they hadn't waited for a consensus. They had put out this really striking uh, finding. Then this group also convened a whole symposium at their School of Public Health where they had a lineup of speakers all sort of, sort of critiquing my article without ever saying that they had some alternative. Or, or, and what all they said that was wrong with it was this idea that they have that you really have to to, to do correct analyses, you have to delete most of the people that you're, you have in your sample. I know that sounds strange, but that actually is more or less what they're saying. So what they were saying is, like, I knew about, they were just presenting what they already done that, you know, I knew about perfectly well. Like, why well, present this again at the symposium? But I was all saying, well, because of our work, Flegel's analysis is completely wrong. And things kind of went on from there in many ways. I would find things like in Wikipedia, somebody put senses in Wikipedia about how, you know, Flegel's article has been repudiated by CDC and she got them, and somebody else posted, I've gotten demoted by CDC for publishing the wrong numbers. Just lots of verbiage flying around and, and these actual organizations and the symposia, but not symposia in a scientific meeting where there's kind of an even handed thing, but symposia at an institution where everybody already said that they thought my work was ludicrous and, you know, fatally flawed. So it was that kind of stuff that didn't really lead to any constructive discussions of what the differences might have been. They were just attacks. Yeah, I'm just going to read a paragraph from your article. You write, quote, at first, I was startled 
but eventually I came to expect partisan attacks masquerading as scientific concerns. I had expected some modest interest in our findings pursued through normal channels of scientific discussion. I had not expected an aggressive campaign that included insults, errors, misinformation, behind the scenes gossip and maneuvers, social media posts, and even complaints to my employer. Many more instances than I have space to describe here. It seemed that some felt that our work should be judged not on its merits, but rather on whether its findings supported the goals and objectives of the interlocutors. interlocutors. I saw firsthand the antagonism that can be provoked by inconvenient scientific findings. So it seems like what you're describing here is not just people saying it's flawed because Dr. Flegel did this statistical thing and that is not the correct thing to use or used a inappropriate database for XYZ reason. It was actually, you know, insults and lies about things that you had done in your research, like attributing certain things to you that had also been done by everyone else who was doing research in this area, or saying that you didn't do something which you did do, uh, which strikes me as, as you described, more like political attacks rather than scientific attacks or discussion. Yeah, it was interesting because the, the 2004 article had a lot of problems and many of them were the same issues that, that our, our data might have been considered to have, too, like using BMI. And then people say, well, she used BMI, which is no good. It's like, well, wait a minute, all this other, these other estimates also use BMI. If you think it's no good for, for me, why is it not no good for them? And why does that mean that their results are flawed? But that, didn't, that connection didn't get made. It was more like this, well, this happened. You know, she did this thing. That's why and it implies without really saying it, like because she did this thing, which is no good. Therefore, that's why she got these results that are no good. But wait a minute, you didn't criticize the other articles that did exactly the same thing. Why do you think that nutrition and obesity are such controversial issues? Well, that's a, I don't know if I, I really know. I think there's, you know, a lot of just personal interest and people, you know, Weight was certainly a cosmetic issue before it became really a burning medical issue, and people are concerned about appearance and so on. And then um, there's an awful lot of, of financial aspects to this whole situation, too. By now, we have all kinds of you know, obesity prevention programs and grants to study obesity. And there's like so many journals on obesity now, where there used to be like one or two journals on obesity. Now we have, I know, six or seven obesity journals. And people are getting all this funding, getting grants, you know, starting centers, they're professors of obesity prevention, and there's all the, the drug companies are, are developing uh, weight loss drugs, which really weight loss drugs were just a, a non-starter in the 1980s, for example. The few drugs that have been used in the 1970s had bad consequences, and, and it was an area that was just very problematic. Suddenly, all these Drugs began to be developed, and bariatric surgery became used. So there's a lot of financial interests that are involved in this. Also, if you have a, a public health organization, let's say you have an organization that wants to promote fruit and vegetable intake, okay? That's a good thing. Fruit and vegetables are good for you. They have nutrients. But how are you going to get funding for it? Probably the best way to get funding for your fruit and vegetable uh, program is to go to your state legislature and say, this will help change obesity levels. That is what will get you some funding. So it, it brings benefits to all kinds of people in terms of their work and their funding and their ability to do you know, a variety of things that are important to us. I think there's a lot of financial aspects that get overlooked. You know, weight loss is a huge industry in the United States. I don't know how many billions of dollars get poured into weight loss efforts, but there's commercial programs all over and, you know, the, the drugs and the bariatric surgery and the the fly-by-night kind of thing. There. So it's, this is a huge uh, economic interest that people have. So I think that makes a difference. So it sounds like you attribute some of the ire over your publications to financial interests that run counter to obesity being as um, large of a problem as it's purported to be? Well, I think actually some of the opposition to our work, it may have had some 
financial aspects like grants and funding and so on. But I think it was also uh, just the idea of like, you know, it's career-wise, I think it's better if you are the, the go-to person for something. Like I am the expert, you know, I'm the person you contact. And we just, you know, somehow sidestepped all that. And then we got all this coverage. You know, the New York Times was writing articles practically every day about our work. And there's all this stuff happening. And, and it's like, people were like, I need to get in on this. I need to be the expert here. I need to speak out. And they try to get coverage. And I think one of the problems that happened, I didn't really understand this until this thing that recently, is that they, they expressed this concern that our, our results might lead to misinterpretations, like that you shouldn't treat overweight people, for example. And because... I think that there's a lot of self-censoring that goes on in this kind of research. And we didn't do any self-censoring. I think that was actually one of our problems. We just put our results out there like we have these categories, here's our numbers, that's it. We didn't try to you know, sweeten it in some way or say, well, but we found this, but really actually overweight is really still really bad for you, so don't be overweight. We didn't say, oh, it's costing all this money. We just report on what our article was actually about. And that is actually not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to put all these things in and talk about, well, this is the epidemic of the century and it's costing billions, something like that. But we didn't have any kind of spin. And so I think that then people interpreted our results as they wanted to. And it wasn't really what we had said. Our, our, our articles don't say overweight is good for you. But some journalists might say, well, maybe this means like Oprah Magazine had a headline Maybe you should gain 10 pounds, for example. And I think that if you didn't like the interpretations, you couldn't, people couldn't really say that we should not have published our results. We should have evaluated our own paper on the basis of messages that other people might get from it. And we should not have published it because of those messages. Instead, they have to say not that you shouldn't have published your results, but your results are wrong. And that's a difference. So I think that's why. The attacks, I mean, no one has ever really found anything wrong with our results. And I should say that all the data we use are completely public. You can get the Haynes data. You just go online, click a button, it downloads. There's no gatekeepers. Nobody can make a decision. Or no one can stop you from publishing it. There's nothing like that. The same thing is true of our meta-analysis. We show every article that we use. You can read them, too. They're on Medline. You can find out from the authors what they meant. So everything is right out there in the open. And we have published so many studies since then just showing that our results are, are robust to other maneuvers. Like we have a whole huge report from NHANES, well, huge, it's like 20 pages, which is kind of huge to me. But hey, look, we take into account smoking and previous illness and weight loss and blah, blah, blah. We still get the same results. So there's nothing really, we have nothing, we have nowhere to hide. And no one has ever said, like, this is actually wrong. You did something wrong. This is really incorrect here. No one has really found that. Uh, you mentioned with Oprah Magazine saying, you know, should you gain 10 pounds? What's, what's kind of interesting about that comment is it seems like there are other, for lack of a better word, like political constituencies that rather than being in favor of everybody having a very small figure, advocate for... Um, people just to be as they are, the sort of body positivity movement. Uh, have you found uh, yourself receiving support or um, being cited by people from certain advocacy groups that uh, have a different alignment than what was the traditional structure of, you know, below 25 BMI to 18.5, you're healthy? Well, I think um, I don't really, I'm not involved in those movements. My work does get cited uh, favorably sometimes, but also kind of negatively because it doesn't go far enough or, you know, it doesn't speak out in a way that, that, that furthers their message. I mean, advocacy groups, just in general, of course, are always looking for something that supports their point of view. And so some people think that what we did was worthwhile and and change things. Other people think that it doesn't go far enough or it wasn't really, didn't really get to the point. So there's different kinds of opinions out there, I would say. Yeah, you know, one thing that I notice whenever politics or advocacy starts 
leaching into scientific discussions is that some research or point of view ends up being described as dangerous. And usually, as you said, it's not so much they have a problem with the you know, specifics of how the research was done, but they look at the conclusions and they draw a line of causality between those conclusions and some something that would actually happen in the world. So to use your example about meat, you know, I, I am not really familiar with the uh, find the the research that you're talking about there, but you could imagine any research which finds that meat is good for you or not that bad for you would upset people who believe that factory farming is you know, a moral travesty or people who are vegans or vegetarians for moral reasons. Yeah, and I think the question is kind of like, what should you do if you're like, I've heard examples, I don't know if these are true or not. There's some data that suggests that, that smoking is a little bit protective against melanoma. I don't know if that's true or not, so I'm just going to throw this out there, but no one wants to publish that because no one ever wants to publish anything good about smoking because then people would say, well, you're advocating that people smoke or something like that. So how should messaging and, and research fit together? I mean, we didn't intend our research to have messages because, among other things, CDC and NIH do not allow you to have messages in your articles. Our articles were all reviewed extensively for several months by both agencies, and I can tell you that CDC does not permit you to say things like, I'm making a recommendation that you do something and that doctors do something different, anything like that. So there's not a word in our articles that says anything like that anywhere, and that wasn't our intention. Yet people took it that way. Now, if you know that you're going to publish something that's going to have that impact, should you not publish it? Should you self-censor? Should you try to fight that, interpret that possible interpretation? What should you do? I don't really know. But we just, you know, said, well, we have data and numbers, and here's our methods. This is what we did. This is what we found. We stopped right there. But what happens if people are going to pick up the wrong idea? Or maybe it's not the wrong idea. Maybe it's an idea that your interlocutors don't like, but it is not the wrong idea. Maybe they're going to pick up the right idea from something you did. So I think that's the kind of area that this gets into. And the 2004 article from CDC said explicitly that, that obesity was about to overtake smoking as a cause of death. And the people who really got perturbed by that were the tobacco control advocates, who are probably the only people who are on my side in a way, because uh, they felt this was probably not right. And they probably thought that just because they're tobacco control activists, but there's also something that was really wrong with the, the data. And that wasn't really the right conclusion either. So, uh, but what do you do? I get it because they were afraid that this would cause um, support to go to be siphoned off from tobacco control activists, activism and, and tobacco control programs and public health programs directed, on, uh, directed towards tobacco control. That the funding would be diverted to obesity control instead. One thing every medical student gets taught is that there is an association between smoking and fewer ulcerative colitis outbreaks or flares. So the one thing that smoking is good for and is still being taught in medical school. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's good to know. <laughs> Well, there's another example, too, like this is from the Dark Ages practice. Of course, cholesterol used to be the big villain. Then people began to notice that people who are alcoholics might have fewer heart attacks. And they realized people who are alcoholics have higher HDL cholesterol levels. And then it's like, wait a minute, but cholesterol is all bad, right? So what is this? And it was people kind of reluctant to say, well, HDL cholesterol, which now everybody calls the good cholesterol, people were reluctant to come out and say, this kind of cholesterol is not bad. Only the other kinds of cholesterol are bad. So that was a, a process that was kind of a, a difficult thing for people to go through. Like, this really can't be true. How can alcoholics be better? And how can this cholesterol be good for you? But it turned out that was probably more or less the right conclusion. Yeah. I wonder how much of these disputes are just, as you mentioned earlier, based on just a la uh, category errors, like having the different categories of BMI, that being a poor way to actually assess health that leads people to become adamant 
about one viewpoint or another, but once you have better ways of categorizing, once you're able to say there are different ways to transport cholesterol and when it's transported in this little vesicle, then it's actually good. And it's when it's in these others, it can be harmful. But until you have that, when you're mixing all those things up together, you can't make those distinctions. So once we have better ways to break things up, we'll be able to talk about them in a more nuanced way that makes more people happy. So what do you think, what did you learn from writing your article? What did it sort of lead you to conclude about how scientific debate should be done? Well, I don't really know the answer. I mean, I think scientific questions, but I was very disappointed by what happened with our 2005 article because I thought our methods were, were new and good. And what we had done was, was should be of interest to people. And that completely got wiped out. I feel like nobody ever noticed how we actually did this because there was so much furor about the whole thing in, in completely different arenas. So I was very disappointed that the science just seemed to get obliterated in the whole you know, process of discussion. One of the things I learned is that a lot of people thought our article was just fine, that it was okay, it was right. But there was no real process by which they, you know, people didn't come out and support us because why would they? You don't really do that with a scientific article. You article, well, this article is pretty good. Then that's all you do. You don't do anything about that. So we had a lot of support that was hidden, not by, not purpose. It just wasn't obvious. But the people who were really against our article were extremely vocal. I was very disappointed in the uh, journalistic coverage of a lot of uh, papers where they just, you know, would, would cite the same words or, or allow, you know, Professor to go on NPR and, and just say our work was rubbish. You know, I, this, this, this didn't contribute anything to me. It didn't give any information to anybody, to the reader or the listener, about what might be the issues. So the issues just never got uh, laid out clearly in any kind of forum where I think people could really look at it. And our, our attempts were limited because... I worked for the federal government. There's a limit to what you can get. Just go and mouth off all the time. You're actually speaking for your agency. You have to be careful about what you say and so on. So there was just like no forum that seemed to really work. And I don't know what the answer to that is. I mean, I think it has to do with the community in, in the research community in some kind of way, too. Is this behavior uh, acceptable? And in many ways, it is acceptable. And people are scared. People are scared they won't get tenure, they won't get grant funding, it's a go against powerful people. That's going to have bad consequences. Now, that shouldn't be the case, but realistically, it seems to be the case, and that people who are interested in researching this area will be discouraged uh, from, from doing similar research because they see what happened to me. I mean, I couldn't really be damaged. I had a government job that was secure. I was already at the highest you know, level of my classification. I didn't need any grant support. There was nothing really that I could be really injured by, except I was insulted. But other than that, I wasn't really injured. But a lot of people would be really injured by this kind of behavior, and it would really derail or destroy their careers. That's a whole situation that I think there should be some discussion about, but I don't know what the answers are. It is, it is an interesting point. I, I didn't really consider how your position within CDC not only protected you after the publication, but it's it, it seems like somebody that was trying to publish a similar paper might have thought twice um, before doing so, especially in light of the sort of reaction that your paper received. So I guess I'm pointing towards a sort of self-censorship around topics that are contentious or going against the overriding narrative for support of your own personal career. Yeah, I think in our case, all four of, of the authors in my 2005 paper, we were all senior government scientists. We all had the same situation. We were really pretty protected. Other than that, I would say that writing an article would be a career-wrecking move. You, and I couldn't advise somebody to go ahead with that. They would just they could ruin their careers by getting on the, off, on the wrong foot with the wrong people. That's really a risk. And, you know, how important is whatever you're studying to you to take that risk? What sort of feedback have you gotten since publishing this article from other scientists in either your field or nearby fields? I've gotten a lot of responses. 
I would say the responses are about 99.9% positive. I, there's like, you know, all these likes on Twitter, like several thousand. And I get emails from people, some people that I know that I haven't seen or talked to for 30 years, other than people I never have heard of, getting stuff. I got something from a guy at Harvard Medical School, <laughs> to my surprise, and a professor at a leading university in Russia. And just a lot of different positive responses. There's also with a story in the Boston Globe, which also garnered further, further responses. And people are extremely supportive more than I would have expected. And there's more interest in this than I would have expected. I just thought I was kind of writing this more to get it off my chest than anything else, I think. And I didn't really expect it would get much publicity or get read very often, but it's really gotten a lot of attention. I guess my final question about this topic is, do you feel like this type of politicization has changed? Like, are things worse now than they were 30 years ago or 50 years ago or 100 years ago? Or are they pretty much the same? Like people were just as ad hominem about whether DNA or protein was actually carrying genetic material. Well, I don't really know the answer, but I would suspect that our current technological situation makes it much easier to have the vituperations flying around all over the internet, whereas before you'd have to write a letter to somebody or ride your horse, you know, to, to complain about something. And now I think it's so easy to have all this material distributed. I mean, there's stuff that I found in Facebook and Wikipedia, obviously, which didn't even exist 30 years ago. So there's a lot more opportunity for this kind of thing to be disseminated now. Other than that, I don't really know. And with that, thank you so much for joining us on the External Medicine Podcast. If people are interested in learning more about your work, where would you have them go on the internet to learn more? Probably go to PubMed and read the articles, I guess, or just Google or just Google my name. It's very very unusual name, so it'll be easy, it'll be easy to find any of the information. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure meeting you. Yes, yeah, good talking to you guys. If you'd like to support us, here are some ways you can help. Subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a review, preferably a phenomenal review. Visit us at externalmedicinepodcast.com and tell your friends. 